Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to hit the record button. I think I think you missed my whole you missed my whole section, Sensei. Well, no. Okay, we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna. I, I was gonna summarize it anyway. I I think, I think what Darren is saying is that uh, many MMA people, BJJ, they learn only that part of a technique or series of techniques that is essential to what they are doing. And as a result, they don't develop the concepts that are necessary for transitioning from one thing to another. Uh, they, they don't have the ability to, uh, this isn't working, or you know, they, they, they're, they're not in tune with their, from my perspective, they're not in tune as much with their attacker's body as they are with what they're doing because the only way you're going to be successful in traditional jujitsu and some other traditional arts is if you are in tune with the other person's body and how, how they are moving. Um, and that's a whole different conceptual approach to doing any martial art. Um, and because they lack this background or experience, um, they run into trouble when they're not in their quote unquote ideal environment, which is competition. Um, and as, as Tom, Tom said, uh, Jiu Jitsu is traditional Jiu Jitsu is not a competitive sport. Um, it's self-defense and, and I run into this issue all the time with other martial artists and they say, well, you can't do that. I say, why not? I mean, <laughs> You know, if you're if you're in a how do you say it? the term proper term is if you fear for your life, um, there are no rules. There are no things you can't. You know, it may not be socially acceptable to do what you're doing, but that's kind of irrelevant um, at the time. Uh, if you have to protect yourself, you protect yourself, and. Uh, it's a whole different approach to training. And I think that's, that's something that's lost in some of the more modern arts, so to speak. And it's because they don't have the, they don't have the depth of the background or the, uh, I'll even say situational awareness to, to deal with random situations that are constantly coming up. When you're on the ground working with a person, working with a person, trying to submit or whatever it is with that person, you've got a given situation, you've got a given position, you everything is given and it's your, you know, you, you tend to think within those narrow parameters. Um, a jujitsu person on the ground is not going to think in a limited manner. They're going to say, you know, what's available to do? That's their first question. Okay. And the second question is not, is it legal or not? Uh, <laughs> it's, can it be done? And if it can be done, a traditional jiu-jitsu person will try to do it because if it gets them out of that situation, if it gets them out from being on the ground, or if it gets them to injure the, their opponent so the opponent cannot continue his attack on the ground, they will do that. And that's, I don't know if I said it in the same way as Darren said it, but. Uh, I think I, you have, Sensei. I, I, I have to agree. Um, in, a, in a real life scenario, if my life is on the line, then I'm going to do whatever I can within my, myself, my experience, my knowledge to be able to defend myself to survive. There's no referee that's going to be there to say, okay, hold on, stop. He's had enough. We're going to save his life and then we're going to move on. That doesn't happen. That's, that's not the reality of it. And by all, with all due respect, I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't respect what they do as an athlete, as a sporting event. Some of those guys are really good at what yes. they do on the ground, but in a real life scenario, um, there is no referee that's stopping me from, 
or telling me that I can't do a certain thing, as you mentioned. Um, they like the arm bars, and, and now they even – there's a bunch of them that are really vulnerable to <laughs> wrist locks, but they're starting to accept that a little bit. But that's not to say that I, I don't want to – I don't want to attack your wrist or even your arm. Maybe I want to attack your thing. Or maybe I want to do something else. Maybe I want to use a nerve attack or something. And they're like, wait, what are you doing? You can't do that. And I'm like, I want, I'm preparing to defend myself for real life, a real life scenario. There is a referee that's stopping me. Here's what I can do. This is what it's going to take for me to move you. This is what it's going to take for me to get a reaction out of you. This is what it's going to take for me to be safe. It's not because the referee is going to say, okay, you can't do that or that it was illegal. This is for me to survive. So whether it's a throw, a joint lock, a nerve attack, one of the joints, whether it's a large, medium, or small, um, whatever it takes, including striking or, you know, and, and then again, what we do, last place that I want to be, and if it's, if it's necessary, I can, but the last place that I want to be is on the ground, hoping that a referee is going to save, save me when that's not a real life possibility. Right. Okay. Any, any uh, Chris, you silently watching you want to make any comments or thoughts or i'm listening <laughs> okay. um okay you know my my observation is um i you know what i what i pick up on is this kind of reoccurring theme of um you know people that you know what we would consider traditional martial arts you know i i don't know why we're always seem to be kind of on the defensive of we're trying to defend that what we have is you know let's just say better you never really see mma people people or bjj people trying to defend in the same way and and to me it's like okay well if we know what we have is a more complete thing and that's what we want and we're good at it and we do it it speaks for itself and those people that are looking for that that's what they're going to gravitate to. It's kind of like cars, right? You have an average car that's made for asphalt. You have an off-road car, you have race cars. And so depending, you know, not everybody wants to just commute, right? And, and some people want to go off-roading. So they start modifying or building, you know, new cars to suit that environment. Other people want to go fast. So they start shedding weight on the car to make it light, you know, ride low to the ground. And, and those cars work great for those environments, but you change their environment and they can't, you know, really go very far where an average road car can somewhat go a little bit off road, <laughs> you know, and they can kind of go a little bit fast, you know, on the track, right? It, it can adapt. Um, so it's the same thing with martial arts, you know, what's happening over time, I think in the past, there was a need for real survival, <laughs> life and death. So, so whether it's technique, strategy, and everything else, whatever label you want to put on it, as far as jujitsu, this and that, it was comprehensive because, you know, anybody that was concerned with survival knew that they needed to know empty hand stuff, kick, punch, grapple. They knew they needed weapons. <laughs> Okay, nobody wants to go in and fight somebody with a weapon when you don't know how to use a weapon. And then they need a strategy, you know, these, these three things, you know, to, to understand how it works. But as peaceful times come and governments kind of take over that function of, of defending, you know, the people, then people focus on competition and sport, you know, their, their focus for practicing martial arts changes. So we end up with things like, you know, judo, taekwondo, you know, uh, kendo, uh, and now, now BJJ and, and MMA, where it's, it's focused for, let's just say, off-roading, or it's focused for, you know, car racing. People don't do those kinds of stuff in times of survival. You know, they do it in times of peace for recreational purposes. So, so why not just acknowledge those for what they are, you know, and, and kind of just let them be, you know, to me, it's kind of like, why do we keep <laughs> trying to defend what we do? You know, what we've chosen, you know, to carry on with is, is what we would consider a more complete approach, more complete system. We like that. We like that flexibility. We like that we can take what we have and shape it this way, that way, 
you know, there's room for us to chisel, right. to make it into a sport, to make it into self-defense, to make it into more of a lifestyle. Those other things have already, are already the chiseled versions of something more complete. That's all they can do. <laughs> you know, in order for them to do more, they have to come back and pick up more pieces because they've already shed those things. So, I mean, for me, I'm, I've always been happy and satisfied with, you know, a more complete system where I can kind of do whatever I want. Today, I want to practice with weapons. I do. Tomorrow, I want to do ground grappling, stand-up grappling. I can do that. I want to do some boxing. I can do that, you know. And I don't have to worry about what environment I'm in. If I'm going to go play in their, you know, sand pit, <laughs> then I'm going to have to take some time to focus on their tool set. And, and Sensei, as you said, you know, their rules, because that's the one thing, you know, if, if, you know, for my students, I've taken them into Olympic level, like karate type of competitions. And the absolute hardest part had nothing to do with conditioning technique or anything else. The hardest part was to think in a rule set <laughs> where you can't do this, you can't do that. So in the beginning, we would end up causing more penalties doing exactly what they're trained to do because it's hard to get out of do whatever you need to do, you know, type of, type of mindset. But it's doable, right? We can always put on more restrictions, but training under a certain set of restrictions and then going into the real world where the bad guy doesn't have those restrictions or doesn't care about those restrictions, you know, that's the problem. I, I have some boxer friends, you know, when I was younger, you know, they were great in the ring, but then if they got into a confrontation, they would often break their wrist because they were so used to wrapping their wrist like a cast, you know, that, that when they punched, they, they didn't have to worry about tightening their fist. It was always kind of half loose. In real life, they would punch the same way and they would break their wrist because, you know, they'd hit something and, and th there's nothing supporting it. So, but they're great boxers, you know, for that arena. So it, it is what it is. You know, I mean, that's kind of my observation on it. It's a testament. I think it's a testament to the value of traditional jujitsu that so many things like judo, to an extent, Aikido or BJJ yeah. have evolved from traditional jiu-jitsu. And it's, as you were saying, Chris, refinements or limitations of traditional jiu-jitsu. In the case of judo, you're not punching or kicking. You're focusing on grappling and kazushi, but so that people don't get hurt and so you can explore it as a sport. That, but that's not a bad reflection on traditional jiu-jitsu because traditional jiu-jitsu is the origin. It's just a path that you've taken from traditional jujitsu in the same way that BJJ focuses so much on groundwork. It's, exactly. it's just a different thing. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, to that end, the people that understand that in those arenas uh, kind of pay tribute to the origins, right? Yes. But, but some of them, you know, are more on the cocky side or let's just say ignorant side, which can happen really in anything. You know, they, they, they not only not give tribute, but they start putting down the traditional stuff that it would never really work. Well, how did you figure out how to get something to work from something that doesn't work? You know, it's like some, how can something come out of nothing? You know? So, you know, how, how did these people survive for hundreds and thousands of years with this stuff that didn't really work? And now you're competing in an arena that's based off of those things. And all of a sudden it works, you know. <laughs> and traditional jujitsu to some extent evolved from the days when samurai were always carrying weapons. Yes. Now, now yes, we explore weapons sometimes, but it's focused on the empty handed qualities of jujitsu, which were traditionally connected to weapons, but jujitsu evolved so that you don't assume that you're carrying a katana or some other weapon. Yeah, there's, a, there's an old uh, Japanese adage you know, that kind of loosely translates to something like this, where uh, basically don't, don't exert or announce yourself on your neighbor, let them discover you first, mm -hmm. you know, before you, you show them, you know, so when somebody is not ready, you know, to, to understand, you know, the history and, and, and the importance of it, because it can actually help them, you see, whatever they've been taught has been a chiseled down version. 
and you know, we don't want to call it watered down. I call it chiseled down because it's still very effective, right? So, but, but that's all they've been taught. They don't understand that they can come back to the source and actually, you know, sometimes just reading history, you know, makes you understand what you're doing even better. You know, mm -hmm. it, it just takes you to that. And that. But they have to be ready for that. So that's why I'm saying, you know, just if we just focus on being great at what we're what we do, you know, approach it, you know, with 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 some humility and, and, and effectiveness in the way we do it. Those people that are looking for more, you know, uh, in, in those in those other areas in the sport areas will naturally seek us out. You know, and, and, and even if they don't switch over, they're still going to utilize us to dive into their history, to dive into their past. And who knows, you know, what may become out of it. But they got to be ready for that. We can't get into this thing of, you know, mine's better, yours better, this is more complete, that less, that's less com complete. You know, that, that could be true in almost anything. You know, the more history of, of man goes on, the more offshoots you're going to have. You see that with religion. You see that with business, you, you know, with everything. Okay, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I, I like the chisel approach. It's, it's, it's a, how do you say, it's a positive approach to the issue. Um, I, I think that one of the nice things I've noticed in large in the traditional jiu-jitsu community is there is a tremendous amount of uh, humility among jujitsuka students, sensei, uh, and, and it's somehow the higher you go, the more, I can't think of the right word, uh, the more humility you have. And uh, I, I, I go to places and, you know, because I'm fairly, I'm fairly soft-spoken. Um, and there's, they said, you're a what? You're, you know that? You know? Can I trust you? You know, you won't hurt me. I mean, <laughs> these are kind of humorous things. You know, you kind of chuckle. But I think I think the more you, the more you, the more you respect yourself and what you do, um, you don't have to let other people know. They, as 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 Chris said, they will discover you. And uh, when they discover you, they're more receptive to you than if you go out with a big banner and say say, here I am, I am great, join my class, you can't wait. Um, you know, <laughs> you, uh, and, and I, know, I know that, you know, not only from jiu-jitsu, I know that as, as a classroom teacher, uh, you know, and I'm sure Thomas knows that in his, his vo vocation, that if you're doing a good job and you are sincere, people will come and, you know, people will come to you. Um, and I think that occurs in any, in any profession, much less in that vocation and, then, and in our uh, uh, ability to interact as humans. We, we don't need to tell, like I say, you don't need to tell the world how good you are. If you're good, the world will see how good you are. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a proverb that says, let another man's lips praise you and not your own. Yeah, and I think this that's to this point. Exactly. I do. I do. Uh, there is an instructional concern that, I, at least in my scenario, touches on this. If I might address it sure. just briefly. So when I started <clears throat> in jujitsu in the early '90s, um, the style that I was originally training in and still have connections to was intentionally trying to blend classical elements, classical jujitsu, and Brazilian jujitsu. And when I got up to about third degree, I began to wrestle with what I would say is too many minds. Because when we're doing the when we were doing the Brazilian, it was sport, tap out. When we were doing the classical, it was incapacitate your aggressor with appropriate force, but you are not trying to just tap them out. And so I went to my professor, my instructor, after a long time of soul searching and said, because the, the art was becoming progressively more MMA oriented and there were folks coming in and their influence was 
pronounced on it. And I asked, will you give me permission to have a daughter Rue that goes back to the original classical side of it? And, and I said, very similar to what Professor Kirby's doing. <laughs> and your books were a big influence. And I was granted permission. So what I, and, and that thus in, in early 2000, the art I teach began in earnest. But what I have found is when I have a student that comes in or a would-be student that comes in and they're looking for jujitsu and if I don't say, I want to clarify between sport-oriented jujitsu and self-defense-oriented jujitsu, or if I try to do both, I end up in some instances becoming less effective in helping my students respond because they, they it, it, unless they do this all the time, if your mind is, is, is sport, you're going to respond as you would in a sport. If your mind is self-defense, you're going to respond as a self-defense. And so I've had to say up front, we teach self-defense oriented jujitsu. We, nothing contrary, we're not saying anything negative about Brazil, but that's not what we do. And when we're on the ground, we're trying to hurt them and get up. And so most of the BJJ folks then have said, okay, then I'll stay and learn it this way. Or great, do you have a BJJ school you can recommend? And there are several. And so I say, yeah, but I've never found that most people aren't coexisting well together in that regard. So for what that's worth. I, I, I do agree with you. There is, there is a, uh lack of coexistence because because of the difference between sport and as Chris said, a set of rules to go with that sport and the way you do it and traditional, which says essentially there is no there are you know there there are no limitations. And that's a different uh, I think if we go back to what Darren said it's just a totally different mindset. Um, and that mindset is what limits what you can physically do because of how you have been trained. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is the difference. And I think as Chris said, you know, we, we don't need, I agree with this, we tend to be defenses of defensive about it and we don't need to be defensive about it it's not a matter of being defensive or offensive it's just as chris said all these arts today and i'm not disputing their validity within their parameters all these arts today evolved from traditional jujitsu in one form or another mm -hmm. um if you go back to, there's, I can't think of the author now, but the, the, if, if you haven't read the book Connections, and it has to do with, it's a different approach to teaching history. It, changed, it just totally changed the way I teach, taught history. And, uh, and you can even get into current social issues and it just changes how you look at it and present. It's, uh, I think, James, James Burke, B-U-R-K-A, Connections. Um, the book came out in the seventies and it just, it, it, it took a history rather than chronological. It took it topic topically and it made so much more sense, at least to me. And so that's how I ended up teaching even U S history. I teach it, you know, topically and the kids would by the end of the semester, they could see the connections between these different areas and they, they ended up with a much better understanding. Um, and I think the, the same thing happens in martial arts. It's evolved from different areas of the world. And uh, uh, jiu-jitsu being one of the older traditional martial arts is where a lot of today's more modern variations have come from. Um, and as Chris said very nicely, you can't make something out of nothing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, sensei, I um, yeah. I have to. Everyone has been consistent with the same message, and I and as I mentioned, I certainly respect all styles, and it's for you know even the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu style, whatever. Um, 
and and I coexist with them really well. I have a lot of people that come in from the from the BJJ uh, where they started, and they've been very successful with competing and and continuing to train and, and developing their skill set. Um, and I also open their eyes when they when they come into a traditional setting as well. They're like, wait, where did that come from? How did how did you even do that? Or what's going on? How did that happen? Um, and that's fine. But, but as as Chrissy David mentioned, and, and you had even mentioned just now, and Thomas had mentioned a few minutes ago, everyone was consistent with the same messages, the origin and where it's from. And we respect all styles and, and every part of it, whether it's an Aikido or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Judo, whatever it might be, we respect all styles. When you get me started, though, is when the, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, they're notorious for this, is they don't acknowledge the origin of their own style, their own system. And that that's when I get started. That's when I'm like, all right, I can't, I can't hold my tongue anymore. Like I don't say anything. I respect them all. But I mean, when they don't even acknowledge the origin of their own system, that's when I, I get started on, on my soapbox, I guess. <laughs> well, your passion. I, I, I mean, I know it. And here's the thing that I love about you, Darren, you can do both. It's obvious to me, you can do both. And then I think for them not to connect. I mean, we had a, a participant in one of our dialogues on here sometime back who talk, was, struggling, was struggling with how can classical jiu-jitsu be appropriate if doing BJJ, he couldn't be beaten. And it was clear to me there was not, there was a disconnect. And, and, and it was interesting to watch the group respond and listen. That goes back several months. But it, it, it's, it's very pronounced. And by the way, Professor, I put that link in the chat section to that book by Burke. There's a 2007 version of it now. Oh, okay. Um, so I put the Amazon link in there for anyone who's interested. Really good stuff. Okay. The, the one thing I want to mention, because I get people will say, you know, what's the advantage of traditional jiu-jitsu? Well, you know, and I say, every art has strengths and weaknesses. And every art has advantages and disadvantages. Um, if you want to know the chief disadvantage of jiu-jitsu, because there's so much more to learn, it's going to take you longer to get to black belt. <laughs> and I said, that's the difference. The advantage of jiu-jitsu is that with the training, you become unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And you have control over what you're going to do. And it could be anything from a simple nerve attack or release to putting that attacker through the concrete and they will not get up or doing some other physical damage, but that's within your control um, and responsibility. But that, that to me is the strength and weakness of jiu-jitsu. It's just, there's so much more, there is so much more to learn. And that makes it difficult for some people to say, they, they don't have, I say, they don't have the patience. Because they'll say, how long does it take to get to black belt? I say, if you're just coming to class once a week or twice a week, four to seven years. And some people, they can't, that's inconceivable to them. Um, I have a neighbor who got his black belt in karate in one year. And he dropped out after that. And I was talking to him. I said, you know, your, your black belt says, well, that was on my bucket list. Uh, <laughs> and that's the way some people approach a martial arts. They, they want to get to a particular rank. And then they can say they have a black belt. Where they've done the, it, it applies to other things as well, not just the martial arts. We all have our bucket lists, um, <laughs> and that happens with children quite often. Also, where you're, you'll yeah. have young children who do it, a, a, a relatively quick karate black belt or taekwondo black belt, yeah. and then the real danger is they get out thinking, "Well, I have this tremendous set of self defense skills that I really don't have to continue training in because I am, I am a black belt." And to get back to the Darren's point about BJJ, uh, one handy thing to do with BJJ people who believe that it's some ultimate solution or ultimate form of fighting is to ask them, well, what happens if you uh, have multiple attackers? What if you're attacked by two or three people? 
how do you deal with, how are all your ground skills going to address the problems that three attackers face, present? Or what if you're on a horrible piece of ground where your ground skills are gonna be very uncomfortable to apply? Or what if you can't get to the ground? You know, a, a traditional jujitsu has an answer for a lot of those different contexts, whereas a lot of other more popular forms don't. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a serious question to ask. Um, and I, I usually, like I probably said before, I've, I've, when I taught at the local junior college, I'd inevitably have two or three MMA or B, BJJ people come in and they'd want to work out on the ground with me. And I'd simply say, okay, if you can get out of a wrist press, <laughs> I'll go to the ground with you. I never have right. to. Uh, and, but it opened their eyes to the factor that um, in jujitsu we stress control a lot, and they each got a real fast lesson on how pain can control body movement. And um, that's all I was really after. Is that you know they they have an awareness that you don't you don't have to injure a person or you don't have to hurt a person uh, to make a point. But that's because in jujitsu, control is a critical factor uh, in being successful on the street. And um, we've, we've spent a lot of time on this topic. I want to get to the next one, if you don't mind, which could probably be a little more fun. Um, and the second topic is how do, we, how do you respond when you make mistakes in the dojo? Um, blunders, mistakes, giving the wrong directions. Um, I, I know some say, some, sensei will say, I never make mistakes. <laughs> I just bury them uh, <laughs> or kick them out of the dojo. Uh, but, you know, it's a serious, you know, I, I, I know it's a, it, it's, it's a hard question because particularly for students that are just becoming, you know, they're, going to become sensitive. They, they want to know what, what do I do? Or how do I save face or, or whatever you want to call it. So I'll pick up a little bit since they, I, I think I make a bunch of mistakes. So, um, <laughs> <You all have>. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I don't try to get involved in them. Like I try to, if I don't know something, I try to acknowledge it right away and try to get to the source. And that's why, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy in being able to participate in these sessions um, for my own knowledge and continued growth. Um, but I don't know everything. And if I don't, I try to own that. And if there's something that I need to research, if there's someone that I need to ask, if there's something else that I need to do to be able to find the right answer or the right approach or the right, right way, I, I'll own that and acknowledge it. Um, but there is times when I have given the wrong direction as well. And then I try to acknowledge it there and then try to work with whoever it was that I was answering or participating or um, whatever I was doing in technique or whatever the answer might have been and try to correct it to the best of my ability and knowledge. And if that takes more or additional research or to go out and ask uh, one of my fellow colleagues, such as anybody here, um, to be able to get the correct answer or the right, right way, then, then I'll do that. But I try to own it is, is my approach. Um, and then it, one of the comments that you had just made about, you know, achieving a black belt level. And, and I, I think at one point in time in, in my training, um, I don't know that I've ever considered being a black belt my goal. Um, but I do know this in, in my own training, the, when I, when I have, when I was awarded my first Don, I, um, I immediately felt great about it. But at the same time, I realized at that point for me that it was just the beginning. I, I truly understood at that moment that I didn't know, I really didn't know anything. Like it was truly the beginning for me. And for me, that's when I actually started to finally get to the understanding, understand that it was a way of life, to be able to understand technique waza and what I was actually doing and what it meant and how it worked and how you can apply it and how you can you you can use it not only in a physical aspect but in a mental aspect and the mental development and the mental growth behind it and how I apply it in my everyday life and no matter what I was doing um that's when I truly started to learn that's when I truly started to absorb what was happening around me 
I really didn't know anything until that moment when I started to really was able to start to understand what I was involved in. I think uh, I would, I would agree with you hundred thousand, 10,000 uh, percent. When I got first on, Seki came up to me and he said, congratulations. Now you're ready to start learning the art. Uh, <laughs> and that, that's, you know, that, that I think for all of us, we recognize it. That's the reality. Um, below Black Belt, we kind of set up a foundation. But I've been in this for, you know, since 1967. I'm still learning. There's still elements I would like to find, gain knowledge about. Um, and I think that's, that's, and any sense they worth his salt will continue to grow. Even if you learn other arts or elements of other arts, it doesn't matter as long as you continue to grow. Uh, that's what, what's important. I had an aunt who retired from working in New York City at age 80 and moved, moved to Westwood in Los Angeles across the street from UCLA at a senior retirement home. And she's, she didn't even eat there. I mean, she was well off financially. Um, and she said, the people there are dead. Mm. And, and her approach to life was, if you aren't learning, you're dead. Mm. So at 85, when, unfortunately, when she had a stroke, and fortunately passed on a couple months later, she was taking classes at UCLA. You know, it's... it's it's an, how do you say, it's an attitude. And I think as a black belt, if you continue on in the art there, you do have a different attitude. You, you are open to learning. You are receptive to new ideas. Um, and that's important. Um, there was something else that was said. Uh, it escaped my mind because my brain cells are getting old. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, um, May I go to the point of in, uh, instructional mistakes for just a moment? Yeah, we all, I, I, I know when, when, if I get in a situation on the map and I could, I would turn to some of my upper belts and say, you know, I'm in a particular hole and I'm stuck. What would you do? And I, and one of the things I always try to ingrain in my students, whether it be jujitsu or economics or government, or God knows what else, it doesn't matter if you're wrong as long as you learn from it. Mm -hmm. And so they would offer up ideas. Some things would work, some things wouldn't. Um, but I think that's the key. And, and that also involves the students in the learning process. Um, because I think all of us, how do you say, we are sensei, quote unquote, teacher. But I think most of us recognize that if we're going to do a good, a good job, there are teachers and then there are guides. Mm -hmm. And I would like to think that good teachers are guides. Mm -hmm. you, you let, to an extent, you have to let students figure some things out and you give them encouragement as they're going along this path. And uh, I, I think that's a, a, a very, it's a valid approach because uh, it takes some of the, A, it takes some of the burden off of you as a quote unquote teacher. And your students respect you more in the process because they, they've been part of the process. They weren't just the bump sitting behind the desk. They, <laughs> they were actually involved in the process of learning. And that, that to me is the key. I mean, is to get, if you get if you get your students involved in the, in the learning process, um, who was it? Uh, Dave Clark who's not here with the consortium. He has upper belts teach lower belts, and that's something I've always done. Because by teaching, they improve their own skill and their understanding of what they're doing, and and the more you can involve the students in that. I don't want to call it self-learning process, but the process of learning and understanding, the more they respect you as sensei. And, mm -hmm. and you know, my, my students know I don't know everything. 
I make mistakes all the time. Um, and sometimes I do them intentionally just to see what the students will, will say. Um, and I don't let it reflect upon me as being, you know, inadequate. And, and I think for, for, you know, there are some instructors that have to be right all the time. There are some parents that have to be right all the time. Okay. Uh, I shouldn't say that my, my dad being, he's deceased and God bless him. He was never wrong. You know, he was an immigrant, immigrant parent, you know, and, and there, there's an issue with, you know, there are cultural issues, yada, 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 but you know, he was always right. And uh, that affected me because I tend to be more receptive to other people's opinions and what they're saying, because you're not always, you know, no single person is always right. Just <laughs> the world doesn't work that way. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, I'm getting off topic here, but uh, so, if 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 you do make mistakes, you admit to them and and you go on. And again, uh, it part part of it comes down to: Are you a problem oriented person or solution oriented? And I think most most sensei and most people tend to be solution oriented uh, because we want to fix things. We want things to be right. The question is how we get there. Okay. Any any other thoughts on this, or has anyone One thing, made some great blunders in the dojo? Well, recently I made a really sizable one. Uh, I had a a student come up to Southern Illinois from about three hours away for some specialized small group and one on one training with me, <clears throat> and we, we do some weapons and. Then Goshen was a, uh, in, in, in Jiu Jitsu Goshen was a, and I was walking him through the, um, <laughs> the Joe Kata that we do. And I completely blanked and it was apparent and he was videoing for his use back home. <laughs> and I said, okay, so here's, <laughs> this is a good example of what happens when you don't practice this regularly. <laughs> I said, so let's get out the den show. And I said, and this is also why you need a din show and read to me exactly what the din show says. And then I'm going to do that. And so he read it out. It's on the video this way. He's reading it. I'm doing it. And I did it a few times and then it came back. And I just said, you're never going to know all this all the time. Um, so refer to your din show and admit when you messed it up. And I said, because I just really messed that up for you. So it was actually freeing. And I, 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 he, he said that he appreciated uh, that, you know, I was just trying to get out of that moment <laughs> and not make him think it was a wasted trip. But uh, he said, I appreciate that you said, yeah, sometimes you forget, go back and make sure you know the book, you know, basically. So yeah. I would love to say I've always done that. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any, any other things on, on, uh, tactfully dealing with blunders or surviving them or um, okay next one is pacing instruction in the dojo how much or how fast can you teach and what we have to have here is a I think a time parameter. Um, I know my classes used to be, I know when I taught the, in junior high, I'd have 50 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes, but it was five days a week. Uh, and some kids were in there a couple hour, couple classes a day. Uh, Parks department has always been two hours. Uh, some of you, and if, if the program starts up again, it's gonna go down to 90 minutes. Um, because we lose, we lose a lot of young people because the parents don't want them getting home at 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night. So it's only going to go to 8.30. Uh, 
you know, but it would still be nine, 90 minutes. Um, so I guess we, what we have to have is how, maybe it's best rather than say how much can you cover or how fast do you teach is you have your hour or 90 minutes or two hours. What, what do you, what kind of segments do you have? Is that a bit fair way of asking the question? Yeah, what I think so. Sensei. Yeah, what different I, I, segments do you have within your teaching time frame? I do a couple of different things. Um, I do what I refer to as a pre-class. So it's just an open mat. And we'll work on whoever comes to the pre-class, whatever their need might be. Um, and that is from six p.m. to 7.15. That is a pretty consistent class. It usually has about eight to 10 participants in it. Um, that class is usually very, very demanding. And those participants usually stay for what I refer to as the official buy-in of class, the traditional class. And then we take that from 7.30 to 9. Um, everyone in the pre-class stays for the traditional class. So they're, they're generally getting three hours worth of material on every Tuesday and Thursday night. Um, and then there's a mix at the end or at the end of the, of the traditional class, which is, which is at nine o'clock that typically stay for another 15 to 20 minutes, sometime a half hour after that want to learn a little bit more. So it's around nine 20, nine 30 sometimes before I'm actually off the mat and, and able to start to get out of the dojo. But the, each one of those sessions has different people. The six o'clock normally participates in, in the traditional, which is the, the 7.30 to nine. And then the nine and the extra minutes behind it um, is a mix between the traditional class and, and some of the participants that came into the, to the pre-class. Um, and then I, we also conduct uh, a, a Saturday morning class at 7 a.m. Um, that is another open mat style and then a another one on Sunday morning, which is another type of an open mat with more of a specific need for people. Um, and then I do exactly what what Dave has said in his curriculum in syllabus um, to be able to have some of the senior students lead that class and teaching some of the beginners coming in and that class is from um, nine to eleven. In, on on uh, Sunday mornings. Okay. Anyone else want to jump in? We divide. Um, there are three components. Uh, so just using an hour, for example, the first fifteen minutes we're going to do kihon. So we're going to work on tai sabaki, kimiwaza, basic skills. If they're going to be a certain strike or so on, <clears throat> and then I'll spend. Um, in an hour, about 20 minutes, uh, if, we're, if we have a particular weapon that's in our sequence, like right now, my class is working on the Boken, and so they'll, they'll have that. And then I'll take the rest of the time, so usually half the class, my math wasn't exact just now, but usually half the class, and we will do a Goshen Waza or two, so we'll focus on applying jujitsu in self-defense scenarios. And then that becomes the basis on uh, the, their curriculum is shaped around scenarios. And so that's how we do it in an hour setting. Okay. Anyone else want to step yeah, in? We, we do, we do something similar to that. Basically Kihon Kata and then uh, Kumite slash Randori. So uh, I always like to start with the basics. Our classes are now down to 45 minutes. So it moves pretty quickly, but I have four different programs that we teach. <laughs> so spread out throughout the week, depending on the night there's, uh, or the day there's there. Like this morning, I got two different classes, um, you know, to do. So we spent about 15 minutes on, on the, uh, the Kihon, the basics that, that uh, revolve around that particular program. And then we do the application for that, the Bunkai for that, that's our ABCs. Then we do it in the form of a Kata, which is a self-defense uh, sequence. 
uh, and then of course the application for that. And then the last part of the class, uh, the last 15 minutes, depending on how things are going, because you know, <laughs> sometimes it varies depending on people's concentration level, their, you know, how tired they are and so forth. We'll do either kind of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, type of a thing with a rotation uh, for, for Kumite, or we do Randori where it's one person against many, you know, in, in, a, in a group. And it's pretty systematic. So every, every one of our classes and programs works the same way. Agreed. I agree with both. I, I may have not answered that question completely, but as TJ and Chris had mentioned, we do the same thing. We, we typically start our traditional class with um, a warm-up session, calisthenic warm-up session. To We spend about 15, 20 minutes on that, moving into our falls and proper roles and stuff like that. And then we move into um, technique, and we spend technique uh, 20 25 minutes on technique. And then after that, we like to try to focus on uh, randori. Um, so we, we give each individual in class, depending on their experience and rank, um, an opportunity to perform some sort of randori with um, unscripted attacks um, that are continuous to be able to move through their technique and waza. And then we do a multiple attacker. And then again, depending on the experience and rank of the individual, that's up how many attackers we typically start with two. And then that is also dictated by their experiences, speed and how, how they're attacked. Um, but as their rank is, we go up to three, maybe four attackers, very seldom um, at one time. And then we'll focus on some groundwork to conclude class. Okay. Tom, Tom did you know that your microphone is off? Yes. Yeah, I did. Go oh, ahead. It's okay. Yep, I'm aware. Okay. Um, we will usually, again, we've got a two-hour block of time, so and we have like a 10-minute break in the middle, five or 10-minute break in the middle. Um, we'll start off with uh, uh, Ukimi Ukim and give them maybe a couple, three minutes for warm-up throws. And it's, essentially, it's you, you go back and forth and do whatever you want to do. Uh, gives them a chance to get their body moving. Uh, we then go to maybe a couple of review te techniques, either from the previous week or earlier. Um, and then we'll get maybe two new techniques in or three sometimes. A lot of it depends on, on the class makeup. Um, because as we, we go through, city has us go through, officially we have 10 week sessions or nine week or eight week. And then we usually have anywhere from one to three weeks in between before the next session officially begins. So a lot of it depends on how well versed the students are in their belt ranks. Uh, I try to keep the last um, 10, 15 minutes for either uh, freestyle attacks with new, you know, multiple attackers. Um, uh, okay, Chris, you can go. Take care. Good luck. Say hi to your students for me. Tell them I all expect, expect all of them to become black belts. Uh, <laughs> um, Chris has to depart for his class. But um, then... Uh, Usually starting the third or fourth week, we have uh, they. I put all the students into a, into situations where they have to deal with random attacks. Uh, I call it deer in the headlights practice, um, and, and that's a skill that I want them. To, I don't care how lousy their technique execution is, and I tell them that up front because otherwise they get really hung up about it. Um, I want them to just respond to the attack and they're not going to know what the attack is um but i want them to to, to do something even if it's block or, or you know and the more they do it the better they get but what's more important is that they respond and not just look like oh my god i've been attacked what do i do they do something um and, and that to me is a separate skill from any martial arts training um because that's important for their survival. The, uh, what I, I will not tell students, 
I, and at the end of the class, I usually try to tell them what we're going to do the following week. I will not give them advance warning on groundwork because I found that many students don't like groundwork because it's not nice, it's not clean. Uh, there's a different set of muscles used. Uh, it's a different approach, or at least they think it's a different approach. Um, if usually the, the one to three weeks between sessions, I will usually reserve for, I'll say, okay, this, this intercession, we're gonna work on handle for three weeks or we're going to kubaton, or uh, we're going to stress nerve techniques, or we're going to stress um, uh, some techniques from Katsugo, um, which are not nice things to do. Um, and they're out of the kind of normal, nice, polite realm of jujitsu. Um, but I'll try and focus, I'll try and have, make it some sort of focus so that they want to they don't have to come to class, but most do. Um, and if, they're, if their parents like to have them in class anyway, because parents like their free time. Uh, <laughs> and I don't fault parents for that, you know. Um, and so that, that's generally what we do. Um, we rarely, I think the only, only weeks we take off are between Christmas and New Year and uh, the Thanksgiving weekend, or if it's a holiday. Other than that, you know, class always meets, and uh, uh, I like them to be there. Um, and we can have a class size ranging from seven or eight to 20 plus two or three black belts. And we're in an area the class side, the, the only downside to our program is that we have to put the mats out and put them back in, into the storage room every time we meet. It's To me, it's a real pain. Um, but usually I tell my students, I'm here at 6.30. You get enough, you get two to four mats out. I'll work with you on whatever you want to work on. And sometimes students come early to do that, and sometimes they don't. And sometimes hardly anyone shows up until 6.55, and then they lose class time because they're still putting the mats out. Um, and that's, you know, there's not, I have, I have no control over that. You find a lot of students take you up on the offer of, having extra time or doing some, some do, but usually it's the same. It's, you know, I'm not saying this negatively. It's the same ones. I'm sure, I'm mm. sure Darren can say the same thing. The st same students are going to show up for the extra time. Um, and they're the ones that somehow surprisingly progress faster. <laughs> <laughs> and they somehow do better. And uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I and, and I've had parents say, well, why did he get a promotion and my son didn't? And I said, well, he practices more. Uh, right. but, but that's like anything in life. You know, you go to school, you, you study more, you, or you study better. I'm not going to say study more because I'm, I'm, I'm not into studying more. To me, that doesn't do anything. If you study better, you get a better grade. It's like the real world. If you do a better job, hopefully you get paid more or you get a promotion or, you know, something of that sort. Um, uh, I think well, just a, my daughter has been working for a, a digital marketing company for the past year now. Um, I think at the end of the month, they're actually going to be offering, rather than being on an hourly basis, they're going to offer her a contract. Um, and she's debating whether or not she should take it, a contract versus an hourly basis. Um, but she, she coordinates all their, she makes sure everybody, I'd say, when she started a year ago, the company had, she was the fourth employee, or the fourth person in the whole business. Now there are about 25 people and she coordinates everyone to make sure they're getting their jobs done. Um, 
and she's become very tactful at it. Uh, <laughs> and she says, God bless the, the years I spent at, at Walmart and being the night manager, you know, and, uh, but, but in any case, there are benefits to doing a good job. And uh, I say, I, th I think a lot of that comes from good parental guidance or good teacher guidance or having a, someone who can encourage you. I, I don't want to say it. Someone who can encourage you to do better um, and give you the positive support to do better because you, you can't just say, I want you to do better. Um, you have to nudge them along the way too. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, the way I've, I've seen uh, Will Harris, who's been my sensei for the last several years, the way he manages dojo time is he'll have the formal class for on a Saturday, it might be for 45 minutes to an hour, but then he'll have it and he'll add another hour on and anyone who wants to stay behind and work on anything they want to work on is free to do that for an hour with yeah. a number of sensei. Or if you're interested in something like BJJ, there are people with BJJ experience. So if you'd like to just grapple for an hour, it's, it's kind of open. And I, I think that flexibility is good. Yeah, I, I, I do. I agree with you and I agree with Darren 100%. You've got to have that free time at some point. Now, I don't have that with the parks program. I mean, they expect me to be out of there 15, 20 minutes after or half hour after. Um, and, and that's unfortunate. I know when I taught junior high, uh, most of my lunch time was spent in the classroom. Kids would come in and they practice. Some would come in after school and practice. They'd come in before school and practice. Uh, <laughs> and, and though, you know, to me, I don't, I don't know how to say this, to me, that's where the real learning occurs because now they're, they're self-motivated and they want to do better. And you can spend some special, you can spend some time just with them, uh, giving them some help when they need it. But most of the time they just want to quote unquote practice or work out or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's okay. You know, you don't need to be, you don't need to be mother sensei. Uh, so, although I did have a, where I think we're going to end with this and leave the next topic for next time. I did have one instance where a boyfriend and girlfriend were working out during lunch and she had him in a headlock pin and he decided he was going to get out. Very bad move. Uh, <laughs> We didn't know what he had done initially, but his neck was we we ended up having to call paramedics because um, his his neck was just in severe pain. He could not move. Paramedics did the backboard thing, um, strapped him down, took him to the hospital. Um, turned out he had a pulled neck muscle. Uh, the parents were very grateful because part of my participant release is a medical care release. And in California, if the kid is, is not dying and you don't have permission from the parents, the medical doctors just have to let the person lie there. Maybe keep them out of pain, but they can't do anything else without parental permission. So, and that's the only time I've used one of those um, in 54 years. The parents were really grateful that that was there. I, I was able to get to the hospital. The, the principal said, just go up, get someone to cover your classes in the afternoon and I was there before the parents were there. But, uh, uh, he had a great deal more respect for his girlfriend after that. Uh, <laughs> it makes you wonder if there was a romantic backstory there like uh, he had it coming. He just... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about those paramedics. That's what you get. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, and and, and Maybe maybe a topic is uh, um, I'm going to put it down here. Call paramedics. Uh, and maybe a, a topic for next time is you know, when do you call a paramedic? Um, and and 
there are, I know, wise or tremendously restrict, you know, different agencies, if you work through an agency, have a whole slew of different policies. Um, and, but that we'll get to, maybe that's a topic for next time because we can really get going on that one. Um, and you can be completely honest and you don't have to fear for what your sponsoring agency is gonna do to you if you speak out. Or you could say in a hypothetical situation. Uh, <laughs> the sensei I know said it. That's that right. Was. Yeah, I, I mean, I do too. Uh, I, I was in one situation where ultimately the assistant principal that came in to see if the kid was really hurt, he was, a, he was an opportunity transfer administrator anyway. If you don't know what that term means, it means you had a problem where you were and they moved you. It's a term that's applied to students that are transferred from one school to another for disciplinary reasons. Uh, and that action ultimately got him an additional administrative transfer. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the principal, when he came back, was absolutely furious at the situation that developed. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, so, but... Uh, so we're going to leave it at that. I, I think we had a good session. Um, I'm glad the names are up because I forgot to have everybody introduce themselves. I apologize for that. We covered we, we covered three of the four topics, and that's pretty good. Uh, we didn't cover uh, uh, the topic that Dave Clark suggested, but he isn't here anyway. So maybe he'll, you know, if, if, if there's a topic, I'd like to have the person that came up with the topic. So... Um, Darren is back. You, you, you didn't get a traffic ticket, did you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sensei, my my uh, phone overheated on the windshield. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I had to wait for the cool. I had to wait for the cool down. Where 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 are you? Right now, I'm in Louisiana, about to approach Mississippi. Ah, uh, it's Head, headed to Florida. It's it's warm there, isn't it? Yes, it is. Right now, 83. Ah, oh, geez, we'll be lucky. We'll be up uh, probably <laughs> around 100 today. Uh, well, yeah, and it should be hotter tomorrow. We're 100. And, I think it's supposed to be 103, 105 tomorrow. Thank God for air conditioning. Uh, <laughs> The the difference, Sensei, is you don't have that humidity yeah, that I'm dealing right. with over here yeah. in the South Coast. <laughs> yes, yes. I was I, middle of the week. I was trimming front porch vines for a couple of days, and uh, temperature was only like eighty degrees, but it, the humidity was like 45 percent, and it was they you know weather things that. It's, it, temperature feels like 90 and i said yeah i agree with that you know just, <laughs> just we cool. average about we average about 80 85 percent every day humidity so that 83 85 feels closer to 100 every day with like a steam bath if it if it gets I a mean, little shower my my wife grew up in upstate new york and we were we were back there as a, a couple summers and as, as she said you take a shower to dry off <laughs> true story yeah. anyway we'll, we'll leave with that high point right? <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll get back to you on the survey results and uh, Sensei, I'm, I'm yes. sorry before you conclude before you conclude um, and you may have mentioned this in one of the other sessions either coming up to or or maybe even just the last one that, that just happened but um, the, the new Black Belt Magazine issue is out and great great ad in the in there for you um very happy to see that and uh very interested in you know and excited to uh get that book as well yeah i i yeah i've got a contract for another book that's pending and they they basically said it's it's going to they're going to look at it in 2021 and uh for those of you who get into writing and publishing, I learned a long time ago, you never hold your breath. Um, because sometimes I just know from, uh, I've had them sit on stuff as long as two years. And then they say, we'd like it tomorrow. Uh, 
<laughs> I mean, have to I'm wait. exaggerating at the end of it, but you know, it's um, you you learn to, it, it really. If you ever get into publishing profession, your writing profession you learn about patients because you think that, you know, they should be able to read something and get back to you in a couple of weeks. And, uh, uh, definitely the same for Wikipedia as we found with that. Oh yes. Yeah, so that, that. Wikipedia. I, I really want to compliment you on that. It's, it's, it's beautiful. The, the AJ got its blurb in there. Right. Uh, yep. and, uh, Tom and, uh, was it John, was John Bowman? John Bo uh, yeah, John Bowman was, Bowman. yeah, he contributed. Bowman, yeah. Absolutely fantastic. And they, they've, been at, they've been at this for something like two years. Yeah, and it's it's so, uh, it would be one thing if it were just the wait, but it's just the impossibility of communicating with the Wikipedia people and having these unnamed editors looking at stuff. It's really a mysterious, otherworldly experience. <laughs> yeah, Thomas, if you could shed any light on that, I've been after it myself for about two years without any success, um, other than every now and then we're still reviewing it or, you know, the hurdles and restrictions of getting it, yeah. you know, published. But uh, if you could shed any light on that, that would, that would certainly help out. And uh, Sensei, to your, to your part, I understand with Black Belt Magazine, I'm completing a syllabus for them to do a online training uh curriculum with them as well that that's going to be a full video production so i'm sorry can you repeat what do you say about the syllabus the uh i'm doing a full uh traditional oh, japanese syllabus for black belt magazine um okay uh production for them. great and great. We, we already had the contract you know take care of and they're waiting on me to finish the syllabus i got three more things to put in there and, and update my bio and then i can i can give them that and we're going to be moving forward with uh production and shooting video for it and, and completing those educational online courses. That's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Good, good, good. Yeah, as good. for the, as for Wikipedia, if you, if you want, uh, if I can get your contact information, Darren, I mean, I can send you some ideas or we can talk about it, however you want to work that. Absolutely. Um, my email is on the, the uh, correspondence that Sensei Kirby sends out. Okay. Yeah. Um, just Darren Mellorine is, is, is my name. So, I mean, you could look it up on there and, and certainly feel free to either email me, call me, whatever you want. I'd love to Absolutely. Hear from it, whatever you have the time for. I certainly Absolutely. Be appreciate it. Just have patience. And the big the big measurement with Wikipedia is how relevant the material is and how, how often it's been cited by outside sources. Like Black Belt Magazine would be an example of a great listing. Um, but they don't want a lot of internal references. Like you can't just cite your own website or your self-produced material. It has to be uh, relevant to, to third party and, and popular places. So that's the big challenge. Yeah, that was, that was uh, I know that, I know from my experience and what Tom and John did that you know, you're, you're, all the books I wrote, magazine articles for the most part were essentially useless. Right. <laughs> despite their value, despite their value. Yeah, it has to be other people recognize you. But there are, uh, there are, there are some magazine black book articles that have been written about me. There are some books that refer to me, and those are the things you know. Those are the things that how do you say get you the credibility? The credibility as far as Wikipedia is concerned. Right. It could be something like a local newspaper or George Kirby's fiftieth yeah, anniversary of they, this. Yeah. They. They. they they, they took that as a legitimate reference source. Right. For me. <laughs> you know, local papers complimenting yeah. me on 50 years of teaching jiu-jitsu. Uh, <laughs> Talk about having to play by the rules. We were talking about judo and BJJ. This is an instance of like, okay, they have their rules, Wikipedia, and you have to submit to them, and that's it. You have to learn. You have to, how do you say, you have to learn how to play the game. Um, just one more thing I'll let you know. <clears throat> years ago, uh, there's a company that, uh, if, if for teachers in California, if you want to get your administrative, if you want to get your administrative credential, normally you got to go to school, yada 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 yada, and it's a fairly expensive process. And this company, for, for a few years, the state of California says you can get your credential by exam, and so this company came up and they they had a recommended reading list. And they said read one of these two books. 
come to our eight-hour session, and the eight hours was spent on how you had to think as an administrator. Okay, mm. the most valuable course I ever took in my teaching career, because mm. that allowed me. You know, I after that I knew knew how to deal with administrators, which allowed me to get most of what I wanted in the classroom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, there's a method to the madness. I got the credential. I never used it because I figured I had more control over what I was doing in the classroom. Um, but the point is, it's kind of like for Wikipedia, you got to learn to play by their rules. Black belt, you have to learn about you. you if you're going to do something for someone to get something somewhere else, you have to find out what their rules are and play by them, as long as they're legitimate rules. You know, are not they're illegal, quote unquote, and, and that's that's the hard part. Um, yeah, and the, I found out the tone of Wikipedia, Darren. This might maybe a value when I first drafted the Wikipedia entry for for both the AJA and for Budishan, There was a lot of mention of George and how George was crucial for doing this. George produced all these books and did this video, the DVD series, and. The comment on Wikipedia from their editor was, this is all great, but it reads more like an ad for Buddhism or for AJA. And it has to be, this has to be much more objective yeah. uh, uh, presentation where you're not touting qualities as much as just dispassionately ex explaining what they did. So I had to revise it accordingly. Yeah, uh, I, I understand that completely, Thomas. I, um, I've tried that approach as well. I think I've got a very similar response from them and then I did go back and try to find anything that was that had me or noted me in um, any other type of publication or anything else that I was in from the New York Times to um, whatever media I was in or whatever and I'm, I'm still struggling so like I said any any pointers that you continue to give me I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly listening to so I appreciate the time. Yeah. I think if you were in the New York Times, that, that would definitely be worth it. That would work. That would work. <laughs> yeah, I, had the, I, had I want to page. look that up now. <laughs> I was on the cover page, the cover page, the first edition of the color um, back in 2005. I was on the cover of their first color edition, the whole page, yeah. Sunday, Sunday release. And um, and it wasn't for martial arts. It was it was just for the for Hurricane Katrina when it, when it hit oh, New Orleans. Oh, oh, OK. Well, you might be able to segue, you might be able to segue and, uh, that into martial arts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I know. Sure. <laughs> I know. But in, in all seriousness, when I when I wanted to teach jujitsu the junior high, um, the principal who he said any you you can come up with any course you want that will keep kids in school because we had a tremendously high dropout rate in the junior high, and I said. I was trying to do this and I was getting nowhere. So he says, he pulls out this old book off his bookshelf of Los Angeles Unified School District approved courses. And he starts going through it and he finds a self-defense sequence. It was part of a PE class. It was five weeks. He says, use this, modify it, stress the self-defense and the district will approve it. And he was right. And it became a class that kids could take for two years instead of just five weeks. So, you know, you, you, you find your sources of legitimacy, should I say, in various places. And uh, it's, it's sometimes you just have to know, sometimes you just need to know where to look. And sometimes there are people that can help you find where to look. It's a well-trodden path with something like Wikipedia because thousands of people have taken it. Yeah. It's a matter of just understanding what what route they've taken and how they've satisfied the Wikipedia people. Sometimes you'll see entries on Wikipedia and you'll, you can't believe that they've gotten up there because the thing seems so insignificant. But right. then if you look at their um, their external references, like they might have been mentioned in some major publication and that's enough to give them this prominence that they need to get in. Yeah, and, and, and you, you know, like I said, part of that for me in the process, he says, Use as much of the phraseology as you can. And, and the same thing applies with Wikipedia. You have to use a certain approach, a certain phraseology. Um, Thomas, I know in your profession, you... 
<laughs> There's a reference I'm sure you refer to quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's all well and good, you know. Um, yep. And, and, and my kids, whether they've been junior high, they, they you know, if, if we were stuck doing something, I said, you know, you have to understand after I have got my administrative credential, to, I would explain to them the logic behind whatever was happening. I said, it doesn't necessarily make sense to you and me, but <laughs> this is the way the ball, the, the stone rolls down the hill. And <laughs> you just got to go with it for the meantime. Um, in, in, as a teacher, one of the things that, I don't know if this is unique to other school districts or in other professions. If the district kind of changed its theme every three years, and once you got used to the concept that they change how they do things every two or three years, you realized after going through this a couple of times that you could simply do what you wanted to do, give voice to what they wanted, and you could do your own thing and not get, you know, you just had to, quote unquote, change the phraseology. And sometimes I, I think professionally, that's the route to survival or, or, or actually doing a good job. <laughs> and also helping other people, other that's people right. in authority positions yeah. do what they need to do. Like in a school, maybe yeah. if an administrator or a principal yeah has a certain set of pressures they're facing from outside, you know, as a teacher, you've got to help them face those. And if it helps going along by presenting a course in a certain way, then you can help them and that facilitates your path. There, there, there are things, you know, how do you know, it, it, it's not as much what you do, but how you do it. Right. And that's the Wikipedia. Right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Right. We'll we'll yeah. let uh, we'll let Darren get to his destination without being pulled over. Uh, yeah, as long as we don't see any flashing lights around Darren, all is good. Thank you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Lost your audio, Darren. But uh, anyway, let's everyone have a have a great weekend, and we'll see see you in uh, probably in a couple of weeks here. Great. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Everybody. Thanks, George. Everybody have a good weekend. Sorry if I missed anything. Uh, take care. No, take you care, didn't anything. <laughs> <All right. laughs> take take right. care. Take care. Thank you. You too, Sensei.